Everybody started wearing flannels and Doc Martens and dyeing their hair with Manic Panic. Even normies who were listening to Garth Brooks the year before. What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. Let's start by turning the clock back to September of 1991. I Wanna Sex You Up by Color Me Bad was at the top of the charts. The brand new Super Nintendo had just hit the streets and this was the height of fashion. Life was good and simple, but everything was about to change with the release of Nevermind by Nirvana, which kicked off the grunge movement and really did kind of change music and pop culture in general overnight. Hair metal was instantly irrelevant. Everybody was wearing flannels and ripped jeans, but it kind of came as quickly as it went. By 1994, it was pretty much over. The obvious factor there was, of course, the tragic death of Kurt Cobain, but as somebody who grew up in the Seattle area and watched all this unfold, I think grunge was dead well before that, or at least dying. So what really happened? What actually killed grunge? But first, I wanted to mention my merch. For example, this Pop Punk with Breakdown shirt, my neon cartoon monster shirt, and this MySpace Deathcore inspired one, complete with an edgy slogan and impact font on the back, just like 2009. You can check those out at the link in the description. Also, join the Discord if you haven't. And with that out of the way, let's get into this video. Being fashionable used to mean looking good. Well, thanks to a fad that started in the Pacific Northwest, high fashion now means, well, you decide. I honestly don't remember the first time I heard the term grunge, but I do remember when this scene got on my radar in about 1990 or so, when I was just first starting to get into punk and metal. I grew up in a little town called Snohomish, about 20 miles north of Seattle, close enough to where I was like aware of what was happening there, but not close enough to actually be part of it, especially since I was a little kid and I obviously couldn't drive. So I would watch this local public access TV show called Bomb Shelter Videos. <laughs> They would play stuff from local punk, metal, and hardcore bands. And one day they played a video by an up and coming local band called Soundgarden. It wasn't totally my thing. I was more into like hardcore than that kind of like rock, but still it caught my attention. Because what you have to understand is at that time, Seattle was not a cool or important city in any way. Because it was sort of the one city that not many bands made their way up to Seattle. Now, these days, it's a different story. It's a tech hub with giant world-class companies where a house costs a million dollars and we get tons of tourists. I guess people see Seattle as a cool city now. But back then, there really wasn't a lot happening here. Bands didn't even come through on tour for the most part because it's just too far away from everything. And this is before Starbucks, Amazon, or Microsoft blew up. So there just wasn't a lot going on and there was really almost no music scene to speak of. But after hearing Soundgarden, I started reading some of the local free weekly papers like The Stranger and The Rocket. And I realized that there actually was more stuff going on than I realized. I read about this other local band called Alice in Chains, an indie label called Sub Pop that was putting out bands like Mud Honey and Mother Love Bone. Again, not 100% my thing because I really was more into punk and hardcore, but still, it was cool to see. And the one band that everybody seemed to be talking about was called Nirvana. They had been on Sub Pop and signed a major label deal and were getting a lot of buzz locally. People were talking about them like they were going to be the next big thing. And they weren't wrong. Nevermind came out that year with Smells Like Teen Spirit as the lead single and they blew the fuck up. It was initially marketed just towards like the alternative music scene on the MTV show 120 Minutes, which if you never saw it, was kind of like Headbangers Ball, but for alternative rock. It's from the Seattle band Nirvana and their second album, Nevermind. Here's the planet's first look at Smells Like Teen Spirit. But the song took off outside of just that scene and quickly became part of the channel's mainstream primetime rotation. And at least from my personal point of view, which admittedly is biased being A, a little kid, and B, from the area, so. But it seemed like Nirvana was suddenly the most important band in rock and maybe the most important artist in music in general. And with that, the grunge explosion was in full swing. The grunge look is an urban lumberjack, anything goes ensemble of duck boots, tattered shirts, and long underwear. Within just like a year or so after that, Soundgarden and Alice in Chains had also 
also blown up. I remember especially that song Rooster being just all over rock radio to the point where it's annoying. Normie girls at my high school showed up wearing Soundgarden shirts. It was wild to see, especially considering that only like a year and a half before that, really nobody outside the tiny Seattle music scene gave a shit about any of these bands and suddenly they were the coolest thing in the world. And before I go on, I want to talk a little bit about why grunge took off the way it did. For one, music in 1991 was pretty fucking corny. The biggest stuff in the late 80s and very early 90s was like goofy hair metal stuff like Motley Crue and Poison. Dudes with teased hair and spandex pants making kissy faces in their videos. And then like super cheesy manufactured pop and rap like New Kids on the Block, MC Hammer, or Vanilla Ice. Ninja, ninja. And I don't think people really knew it at the time, but they were tired of it because people can smell bullshit, right? So I think people were ready for something that felt authentic and real, which grunge really did. It's hard to communicate now how just radically raw and stripped down and real it felt. You've probably heard this before, but it really just can't be overstated what an impact it made. The people in these bands were the exact opposite of all the shiny, polished, kind of lame pop stars and the spandex teased hair dudes and hair metal. They looked like dudes that just kind of showed up and happened to walk on stage in whatever clothes they were wearing. Probably because that's exactly what happened. And they just kind of generally carried themselves like people where if you ran into them at 7-Eleven or something, you could say hi to them and chat with them for a minute. It was a very new idea at the time for quote unquote celebrities to feel so down to earth and accessible. Club Rock Candy, where we're gonna see Mud Honey perform tonight. And also it was the perfect combination of three different rock subgenres that had all been gathering steam in the underground throughout the 80s. Punk, indie rock, and metal. It had that no frills, stripped down, like anti-pretentiousness, no bullshit attitude of punk, but those angsty, melancholy kind of vibes and melodies and vocals of indie rock, some of those jangly guitars, and the big guitars, aggression, and power of metal. So it was able to appeal to such a wide audience because it really could speak to anybody that was receptive to any kind of like edgier guitar music. Grunge means pseudo crappy music made by people affected by adverse weather. And also, despite the fact that it was a very anti-rock star genre as a whole, it had a huge number of people with just outsized star power and charisma that all happened to be in basically the same place at the same time. And yes, the music is important, but remember the success of any genre, especially at the mainstream level, is just as much, maybe even more, about whether it has people who can be the face of it, people with that kind of charisma. And although it may seem counterintuitive, given that it was in some ways a reaction to all the annoying stars of the previous generation, it definitely had that. I mean, think about it. Kurt Cobain, Eddie Vedder, Lane Staley, Courtney Love, Chris Cornell, Scott Weiland. These were all huge stars, big personalities personalities, super talented people who are still relevant today. It's really kind of a shocking amount of talent and star power to have concentrated in one place at one moment in time, not to mention all the great musicians and the bands. And let's talk about exactly what that impact was. First of all, as you've probably heard before, but it's true, they pretty much instantly overnight made every other form of rock feel just like corny and dated and stale and just out of touch. Especially hair metal. I mean, how could you take stuff like Warrant or Poison seriously after you've heard Alice in Chains and Nirvana? Grunge made that hair metal stuff seem like a bad SNL skit by comparison. And I'm not exaggerating here. It really was that dramatic. And the hair bands knew it too, because you could see them really scramble to reinvent themselves. A lot of the bigger bands like Motley Crue did like a grunge reboot album where they had some gritty 90s type artwork on the cover. And they tried to dress a little bit less sunset strip. Maybe they even put on flannels and played some like slightly grungier riffs. And I give them all credit for trying to adapt, but it was just clear that their time had passed. There was nothing they could do to stay relevant, but it was actually way bigger than even that. Grunge kind of like took over pop culture in general. 
Everybody started wearing flannels and Doc Martens and dyeing their hair with Manic Panic. Even normies who were listening to Garth Brooks the year before. And this might not seem like a big deal to younger people who are watching this that are used to seeing e-girls walking around the mall with green hair or whatever. But this was not at all common or normal back then. Nobody had piercings or colored hair in 1990. So it really was kind of crazy and shocking to see some girls show up at school on Monday with a brand new alternative makeover. Now, personally, I never really cared. I mean, it's just really not that big of a deal to me, not something worth getting upset about. But a lot of people that I knew definitely were upset about what they felt like were all these culture vultures coming along. Because up until then, if you saw somebody who was dressed that way with green hair and piercings or whatever, you could reasonably assume that this person was part of that secret club. And yeah, sure, you know, maybe some of the people who got that overnight alternative makeover were doing it because it was just trendy. It was something they would just experiment with for a month or whatever before moving on to their next phase. Grunge is the fashion trend launched by the hard driving guitar music known as the Seattle sound. But I think for a lot of people, it was sincere. Grunge was their gateway to alternative culture because they just honestly didn't even know that all this stuff existed before then. I mean, I lived in the Seattle area, so I was aware of it, but let's say that you grew up in like Evansville, Indiana or Davenport, Iowa and had no idea that any of this was happening. How else were you supposed to get into it other than seeing Soundgarden and Pearl Jam on MTV or the cover of Spin Magazine? And is there something wrong with that if that's how you discovered it? Personally, I think it's awesome that these bands were able to reach such a huge wide audience of people and probably be a lifeline to all those kids who felt stranded in their shitty little hometown where nobody understood them. And I think part of that is because the guys in Nirvana were those kids. I mean, they come from a town called Aberdeen, Washington, which if you didn't know is basically a depressing little redneck shithole in the middle of nowhere. It sucks. We um, vandalized, skipped school, smoked pot, smoked cigarettes, and that's about it. And so I think that's partly why they were able to speak to that kid all across the country and the world. And also for as many, let's call it trendy culture vulture posers that it may have brought in, it also shined a light on a lot of genuinely cool independent music and culture. For example, whenever Kurt Cobain would do press in these huge mainstream outlets like MTV and Rolling Stone, he would always talk about his punk influences like Black Flag and MDC. Or how many kids got into like the Melvins or Black Sabbath because Kim from Soundgarden was always mentioning them. All these artists were very deliberate about this. I think they knew exactly Exactly what was happening that this was their chance to use their platform to draw awareness to their influences and they did you like venom black flag black sabbath sonic youth or am who's good to stooges motorhead i mean like look at this show nirvana did in 1992 which was well after they had blown up helmet poison idea and jello biafra as the mc that was them using their platform or when chris from nirvana wore an ssd shirt on mtv on that one awards show thing where he dropped his bass on his head in particular i think they really did a lot for indie rock especially like the K record scene in Olympia and all the Riot Girl bands around them, like Bikini Kill. Riot Girl never sold a lot of records, so it wasn't a big deal commercially, but I do think it was a big part of the conversation back then. I mean, all these teen magazines would write about Riot Girl and stuff. It was a big deal. And I think it made a real difference to how we talk about gender issues in the scene now. I mean, if you look at the band that Epitaph just signed, the Linda Lindas, that could just be a K records band from 1992 with slightly better production. But that said, even as early as 1992, the grunge scene was starting to kind of show signs of stress. The first example of that that I remember is Pearl Jam, who for some reason kind of seemed to get left out of the conversation when people talk about grunge, which is strange because they were easily the second most popular band in the genre after Nirvana. I mean, they've put out, I think like 10 albums and every single one of them has been in the Billboard Top 10. But anyway, I'm not really sure where it came from, but there was this kind of tension or beef between Eddie Vedder and Kurt Cobain, where Kurt kind of accused Pearl Jam of being false grunge. And I guess they kind of settled their beef. And again, I don't really even know what the basis of it was, but you already kind of got the sense that this thing had gotten way, way bigger than anybody ever intended or imagined. And it was like cracking at the seams. The main issue being that there were so many people who were clearly trying to jump on the bandwagon of this thing that was kind of expressly intended to be anti-bandwagon. The biggest example of that would be Stone Temple Pilots. Their first album came out in 1992 and they looked and sounded pretty much exactly like a Seattle grunge band despite the fact that they were from San Diego.
And it sounds kind of silly to say it now, but this was controversial at the time. I remember a lot of the fans and the media at the time kind of looking at them as posers who were just jumping on the grunge bandwagon, which for the record, I don't really think was accurate at all. I think they were a great band that stood on their own and in any resemblance to the Seattle grunge thing was probably just a case of a lot of smart people on the West Coast kind of cross-pollinating. But the point is already you could see that there was this tension developing between the inherently anti-commercial, anti-rock star culture of grunge and on the other hand, the pop culture machine that was trying very, very hard to commercialize it and make as much money as they possibly could off of it and turn all these people into rock stars who I think didn't want to be rock stars at all. When these bands started to get popular, all of a sudden everyone wanted to find the next Nirvana. Everyone wanted to sign the next Pearl Jam. Like if you read or watch interviews from back then, you can see them kind of like squirming and wanting to just get the fuck out of there. Like kids that are forced to dress up for family photos or whatever. You really get the sense that people like Kurt Cobain and Eddie Vedder just did not want to be in the spotlight of the mainstream media. They're kind of like, oh fuck, how did I get here? You can just see it on their face. Now, to be clear, they signed to major labels, so obviously they did want some kind of larger audience for their music, but I don't think they ever wanted to be sitting there across from some dumb normie TV host asking them stupid questions about why they wear thrift store sweaters or how they feel about the term grunge, which for the record, I'm pretty sure everybody hated. I was a little bit too young to really be like, like a part of the grunge scene locally since it was really people in their 20s and I was like 14. But from what I could tell, the musicians around here basically wanted nothing to do with anything grunge because it had gotten so overhyped and turned into such a bandwagon. Like people were moving here from other parts of the country to start a band and be part of this quote unquote grunge scene that definitely did not want them. But if I had to point to one single moment where grunge died, it would be pretty obvious. The day that Kurt Cobain killed himself in 1994. I don't know how it is these days for kids when a celebrity dies, but at least for me and my school, it felt like a national tragedy, almost like the president had gotten assassinated or something, which was probably in part because he was like a local hero for us. But I got the sense that it was a pretty big deal nationally. Like I remember our English teacher, like putting the lesson plan aside for that day and just sitting down with us and talking about it. And a lot of the kids in the class were like visibly shaken up about it because for our generation, this was the first time that somebody like him, somebody who we could all tell was a little bit troubled and had that darker side, but was also like a cool, compassionate, down to earth person who kind of felt like our older cousin or something like that had gotten so famous and influential. And so I think for a lot of people, having him die so suddenly in such a tragic way felt like they had lost a friend. But as I'm pretty sure he would agree, grunge was kind of already dead by then, or at least dying. It had become a victim of its own success. Too many people hopping on the bandwagon, too many shitty fake grunge bands with uninspired music and putting on the grunge uniform, which by the way, was never supposed to be cool. Nobody ever intended that to be cool. People wore flannel shirts here because Seattle was kind of like a blue collar logging town back then. And Kurt Cobain was from Aberdeen and that's how Aberdeen rednecks dressed. Probably still do. But most of all, the just disgusting <laughs> cartoonish commercialization of grunge. It's really hard for me to communicate how grossly commercialized grunge had become by the mid 90s. Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Nirvana. Where else can you get the Seattle sound? Best Buy. There were literally ads on TV like, this fall, come to JCPenney for the hottest grunge outfits for back to school, without like a hint of irony. And of course, the ultimate and clueless played out 90s Gen X marketing, this Subaru commercial. This car is like punk rock. Now, just trust me, this is relevant. Looking back, I really can't think of any subcultural movement that ever got co-opted by corporate America so quickly or completely. They just ran it into the fucking ground in like a year and a half. It's amazing how quickly they turned it from this fresh, vibrant underground scene into basically just a costume and a marketing gimmick. And you have to think that that was a huge bummer for everybody in the bands who wanted nothing to do with any of that stuff. It's so profitable and they'll just keep taking and taking and taking and they, they're, they, they just don't know how to restrain themselves. But with that said, although in hindsight, grunge really only lasted for a couple years, I think it made a huge impact that's still with us today. For one, I think it kind of permanently killed the idea of this old school rock star that we worshiped as a larger than life hero. Yes, that does still happen to some extent, but I think never the way that it was in the 80s. The people in the grunge bands felt like real actual human beings without all the phony bullshit and posturing, and that was just so refreshing. 
Now, I think you could make the argument that that might not have been an entirely good thing for Rock from a marketing perspective because stars definitely sell, but I think it was an okay trade-off. Rock got like 90% less douchey thanks to grunge, and that's worth it to me. And I think in a lot of ways, grunge is still kind of the template for the aesthetic and culture of disaffected, disenfranchised suburban teenagers. I mean, really, new metal, emo, and whatever you wanna call like TikTok culture and the e-girls and all that, those are all basically just updated, remixed versions of what the grunge band started because I think they really struck a chord. They were vulnerable in a way that celebrities really just weren't before then. Like Alice in Chains wrote an entire album about being a heroin addict and they didn't try Try to hide that at all. I mean, they have a song called God Smack and people really connected with that vulnerability and raw emotion. I mean, even now a song like Hate to Feel, I almost can't handle listening to because it's just so real. And that's really kind of my biggest takeaway from grunge personally. Given how Kurt, Lane Staley, Chris Cornell, and Scott Weiland ended up dying, when I look back, it's really kind of heartbreaking to realize that we were just watching them self-destruct in front of us and almost like using that as entertainment. To be fair, I think people back then didn't understand this kind of stuff. And if we saw that now, we would think about it very differently, but that is what was happening. But I also know that they helped a lot of people who are struggling with their own demons and open the door to alternative culture for tens of millions of kids all over the world. So although grunge was really only a thing for a few years, I think it kind of did change the world, at least in some small way. The nation's media have declared Seattle the coolest place in the known universe. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments. And as always, I want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. It is because of your support that we're able to do the podcast. That's how I pay the producer and editor who makes the whole thing happen. Patrons get every podcast a week early. There's an exclusive members only Discord channel that I'm in all the time. I do giveaways, I do Q and A's. There's a way to have me review your music or artwork or anything else you would like to get my eyes and ears on. So if that sounds cool, you can join the Patreon at the link in the description as well. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.